Welcome back to our study on the parables. In this video today, we'll talk about the parable of the lost treasure and the parable of the valuable pearl. But there is a caution. As Christians, we've studied these parables for years and even for thousands of years have allegorized these parables to say that Christ is the pearl, the church is the pearl, we are the treasure. There are so many different takes on what this parable actually means. But the problem is, none of these allegories agree. So if we have all these different ways to tell the story, and our meanings as Christians don't all agree, let's leave those aside for now, and let's take a step back into the first century as Jesus' original listeners were hearing this for the first time. They didn't know that Christ was going to be crucified. So how would they have originally heard these two parables? Now remember, parables bring us a challenge. It should challenge us to make a change in our lives so that we uh, live our lives accordingly in the kingdom. So today, we will tackle each of these parables separately, bring them together because their meanings actually complement each other. They're twin parables. And so what we'll do is try to peel back the layers of all of the thousands of years of allegory to get back to this original meaning of what Jesus was trying to say with the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl. So let's get started. We'll begin in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, as a Kansan, when I hear treasure hidden in a field, this is where my brain goes. This is my modern day example of a treasure hidden in a field. This is the Steamboat Arabia. So if you know anything about like Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn, that time period, you know there were a lot of steamboats, especially on the Missouri River, so near Kansas City. And uh, back in 1988, uh, one of our local treasure hunters had a hunch and some local lore that there was buried treasure in a field near the river. And sure enough, they searched for it and came across this amazing wreck. Now, the Steamboat Arabia was actually uh, what we would call a floating Walmart. And it was carrying supplies to uh, set up frontier towns. And there were women and children aboard because they were headed off to join the men. And sadly, it, uh, their steamship hit a sycamore log and it snagged on it and sunk the boat. Everyone was uh, rescued except for the poor donkey who was still tied on the ship. So um, at this, what is now a museum, they actually have the donkey's bones on display so you can pay tribute. But uh, they also show all of the amazing things that were in this treasure. Uh, I mean, everything from carpentry supplies to build frontier towns uh, to boots and clothing and buttons. There's a picture of all the, the buttons that were found aboard, uh, as well as dishes and just everyday items. Um, quite a local treasure for us, but I know this is, of course, not what Jesus is talking about. This is just where my brain went first when I heard treasure in a field. <laughs> this is kind of popular here locally. Uh, if you live in Kansas or Missouri, Nebraska, come visit Steamboat Arabia Museum. Now, thinking about the first century audience, what would they have heard? Now, this would have been a little bit after Jesus, possibly still in the first century. Uh, what you're looking at here is a discovery found in the caves at Qumran. You may be familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, many of them had uh, books of the Bible written on them. This particular scroll did not have that. Uh, this is actually made out of copper. So someone had to um, smelt and forge copper, the metal, and flatten it out. And then they were able to put their information 
in this scroll. Now, when it was found in the caves, remember these were found back in the 1940s. You probably remember the story of the Bedouin shepherd lost one of his sheep. He peered in a cave and like threw a rock in it. And there's lots of legends about how they were found, but he threw the rock. He heard a shattering sound and went in and discovered jars filled with scrolls. Well, one of the scrolls they found was the copper scroll. Now, metal is not uh, very easily unrolled after it's been there for so long, 2,000 years. And what they ended up doing was just cutting it into slices in order to read what was on the scroll. So you can see those green pieces, that's um, copper that's been oxidized. And what they discovered was kind of incredible. It was a first century treasure map. So this was no ordinary list. This contained 60 some different locations where treasure, presumably from the Jerusalem temple, but not confirmed, uh, was hidden. Some of it was hidden in fields, some of it in caves, some of it under rocks. And this treasure uh, also included over 4,600 talents of precious metal, uh, so money, uh, making the total haul worth in excess of a billion dollars today. A huge, vast treasure that was recorded on this copper scroll found in the caves at Qumran. Oh, and there's also the story in Matthew 25 later on about the servant who hid his talent. So more treasure hidden in even in that story. So it's definitely safe to say that treasure hunting was just as popular then as it is now. Maybe even more so because you think about the widespread poverty in antiquity and it's even in Jesus' time, Josephus actually records stories of, of Jews hiding their treasure, like, for example, in strong boxes under floorboards uh, or out in a field, as our parable reads, and the Romans trying to go find them. So treasure hunting, treasure finding, very popular. Now, this hoard of coins I'm showing you on the screen actually came from around a thousand years ago, and it was discovered in Israel in Caesarea Maritima. So Caesarea by the sea, and you'll notice the sand under the coins. Uh, they found this huge hoard of coins um, from a shipwreck. And this is very common in the Mediterranean. And so again, we've got more treasure hunting. <laughs> and Jesus, when he tells his parable, uh, it maybe envisions a hoard of coins like this. Maybe this is what that man finds, say, in a strong box or in a bag, hidden, buried in a field. And so perhaps this man in the parable was a, a tenant farmer living on and working on the land. So he had, you know, ready access to treasure hunt in his free time. Now, what's interesting in this parable that Jesus tells the man stumbles upon this hidden treasure. He doesn't take it right away. He could have. Presumably no one was watching. Finders keepers. He could have taken it, but he didn't. Instead, he went and he sold all he had and bought the field. Now, Jewish law said that, um, you know, if you had a title deed to a land, you owned the land plus everything in it. So uh, presumably the man did the right thing, bought the field. Finding treasure for this man was like our modern equivalent of winning the lottery. This was huge for him. And I want you to go back and think about that process. He didn't just take the treasure. He sold everything he had and he bought the land with the treasure. So the behavior is what I really want to focus on for this parable, much like when we talked about in the last video with the mustard seed and the yeast. It's that transformation process. He doesn't just take the treasure. He goes and he sells everything he has. He does everything in his power to obtain this thing of value. So just like the mustard seed and the yeast, it's not the thing. It's not the treasure. It's the object here. It's this process. It's his behavior of doing what it takes to obtain the thing of value. Even though for 2,000 years, Christians have allegorized 
uh, this parable and said, well, the man represents this and the treasure represents this and the field represents that. Instead of going that direction, let's pull back a minute. And let's think about what those first century listeners would have understood. Because again, remember, they didn't know that Christ was going to be crucified and bring salvation to all. So it's not salvation. Um, So what is it for those first century listeners? They would have known that Jesus is talking about the kingdom because Jesus said that in the parable. The kingdom of God is like... A man who does everything he can to obtain this thing of value. Uh, So Klein Snodgrass says that Jesus told this story to announce the kingdom, well, announce the presence of the kingdom, and to elicit the joy of discovery and the radical action of following him, of following Jesus. The joy of discovery and the radical action of following him. So Jesus is saying that the kingdom is the ultimate thing of value, and we should do everything we can to obtain it. But oftentimes we're very easily distracted and we look for all kinds of other treasures of lesser value. And I came across this story And it's about a a father who took his son to one of those local rock and gym shows. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those. They're kind of fun. Uh, But uh, he came across this man's table and he had a a box of different rocks in it. And, you know, it said any rock, $15. And it was filled with agates and filled with geodes and other various rocks and, and minerals and things. But there was one that caught his eye, and it was described as potato-shaped, potato-looking. And uh, the guy selling it said, you know what, that one's not as pretty. I'll just give that to you for 10 bucks. He'll just give you a discount. All right, so, so the guy took it home, polished it up, and discovered it was one of the largest star sapphires ever discovered, uh, valued at millions of dollars. Now, this was way back in the 80s. Um, But what's interesting is that this gem was buried in between all of these other prettier rocks. And maybe sometimes the kingdom is that way. And in sharing this story, again, Klein Snodgrass says that a lot of us spend our time looking for pretty agates and miss the sapphires of life in God's kingdom. And when we're surrounded by so many other beautiful treasures, uh, bright baubles, and things that capture our attention. It's hard to make the right choice and pick the right thing of value to pursue. And this reminds me of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, one of my favorites, uh, where at the end, they're presented with all of the different chalice or cup choices, but which one uh, did... Christ drink out of at the Last Supper. And of course, this is all fiction. Uh, But I think the principle is the same. When you have so many beautiful things of value to choose from, which one would you choose? And of course, we know (laughs) that the bad guys chose poorly. Right? And they, (laughs) they didn't make it. But Indy knew or had a hunch that the, the, the cup that Jesus would have drank out, out of would have been the cup of a carpenter. And so, of course, he's the hero of the story for a reason. But it just makes you think of all of these things of value. Do you pick the prettiest one? The one with the most jewels? The one that's the most sparkly? How do you decide what is the treasure of ultimate value here? Let's let this settle for just a little bit. And let's switch gears and move on to the parable with the pearl to see what meaning that holds for us and if we can use the two together to formulate what Jesus was really getting at for that first century audience. So back to Matthew chapter 13 and down to verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant 
looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. I'm sure you already know how pearls are formed. They're made by a creature in the sea. And this is an example of one of the biggest pearls ever discovered. This was found by a Filipino fisherman who uh, promptly hid it under his bed, as one would with such a treasure. Uh, but it was later weighed to be 75 pounds and valued at $100 million. This thing is two feet long. It's huge, massive. Uh, but he kept it as a good luck charm. Now in ancient times, think about how pearls were collected. Without modern uh, oxygen tanks and breathing apparatus, they would have had to free dive uh, to go collect these pearls. And they would have collected them from the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea, all not too far uh, from the modern country of Israel there today. These lovely earrings are an example of how women Wealthy Roman women in the first century wore pearls. These earrings jingle. They make sound, actually. Uh, they're known as crotalia from the Greek word for rattle or castanets. That's really cool. I mean, that they would jingle. Numerous examples of these earrings have been found at Pompeii and Herculaneum. And we actually know that, that Drusilla from the Book of Acts died in Pompeii. Maybe she wore earrings like these. I don't know. I don't know. Fun to think about. Pearls are ubiquitous today, and we often use them to accessorize other gems. But all throughout recorded history, um, pearls were of the utmost value. They were called the queen of gems. Pliny the Elder said that pearls had the topmost rank of all things of price. Pearls were regarded as the most valuable objects in the world, of course, because they were naturally made and hard to come by. Um, and so they became a figure of speech for things of ultimate value. So those earrings that I showed you just a moment ago were very, very expensive, but the necklaces that wealthy Roman women wore would have been in the tens of millions of dollars in today's currency. Just extremely expensive and likely unattainable for Jesus' first century listeners in Galilee. Likely none of them had pearls on that day when they were listening to Jesus' parable. Now let's think about the merchant in Jesus's parable because he already has pearls. He's looking to buy more when he comes across the pearl. So already we know a couple things about this merchant. We know that he is not likely a tenant farmer like in our parable of the treasure. He clearly is a man of means and his clientele are the most wealthy clients in the world. So this is top dollar luxury goods that this merchant is selling. And if we back up a minute and think about a merchant, the occupation of merchant, uh, especially through the Old Testament, there are not many nice references to merchants. Um, in fact, Ben Sirach, uh, an extra biblical source, said that a merchant can hardly keep from wrongdoing, nor is it a tradesman, nor is a tradesman innocent of sin. Uh, so for Jesus to start off the kingdom of God as like a merchant, people would have been like, whoa, full stop. What? <laughs> a merchant? Uh, you think about merchants were the ones who sold Joseph into slavery. Um, think about the money changers at the temple in Jesus's time. He said, you're turning my father's house into a marketplace. The, the word for that is uh, our word for emporium, which is what merchant means. So what did Jesus really want his listeners to glean from a parable about a merchant who is not looked on very kindly, uh, let alone a merchant who is selling pearls, the most luxurious, good, most expensive object you could buy in the ancient world? What is he getting at? 
again, like the treasure found in the field, let's think about the process that this merchant went through. So the merchant discovered this pearl. He went and he sold all of his goods to buy the ultimate pearl. Okay. Again, it's the process. Now, the Christian church for 2,000 years has said Christ is the pearl or we are the pearl or other symbols to connect it to salvation or to the cost of discipleship or to lots of other meanings. But again, if our goal is to get back to what those first century listeners understood, they didn't know about the crucifixion yet or about Jesus bringing salvation or any of that. So we're not going to use symbols to decode this parable. We can do it with what we know um, from the culture at the time and from what we know from scriptures. So let's think about the process that this man went through. Just like in the first parable, he sold everything he had to obtain the thing of ultimate value. And Jesus saying the kingdom is like this process. It didn't have to be a pearl. It didn't have to be a treasure. It could have been any number of things. Jesus could have used any other objects to describe this. So it's not about the object he picked, although they were attention-grabbing objects, of course. It's about this transformation of someone joyfully discovering this amazing thing of value and they do everything they can to get it. The merchant did the same thing. And I want to look at one more example. Matthew 19 has the story of the rich young ruler. Remember he came to Jesus and he asked the question, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal Life And what did Jesus tell him? He said, go sell your things, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. Did he do it? Was he joyful? Not exactly. He went away sad. He couldn't do it because he was very wealthy. He had many other valuables that he wanted more than the thing of ultimate value, which is the kingdom. And so in describing this story, Amy Gillivine says that this merchant in the parable does what this rich young ruler cannot do. The merchant, someone who likely would not have been a pious Jew. If someone who is not a pious Jew can recognize something of supreme value and give away, like sell all of their things, sorry, not give away, he sold it, <laughs> sold all of his things to get the one. The kingdom of God is like that process. Now, I want to make a distinction because there are some followers of Jesus who say that this means we have to be poor, we have to divest everything, and that is the only way to follow Jesus. Well, that is a way, yes, but I don't think Jesus is using this parable to talk about money. He's not really addressing economics in this parable. Now, there are other parables where he directly addresses economics, but not this one. I don't think this is it. Because there are other followers who keep their finances, but then use it to support the mission. They use it to support missionaries. They support homeless shelters, uh, food banks, uh, provide hospitality, and so you have both. So I don't think this parable is about uh, the money necessarily. It's what you do 
when you discover this thing of ultimate value and what action do you take to obtain it? So A.J. Levine points out that if we restrict the meaning of this parable to just the pearl, we've completely missed Jesus's provocative story because it's not just the pearl. It's the process of doing everything you can to attain it. That's the point of both of these parables. Doing everything you can to attain it. So, what actions in your life show people the value of the kingdom of God? What do you do every day at the store, on the soccer field, in the office? What do you do? What actions in your life show people the value of this kingdom that you profess to follow and be a part of? What can people see in your life that shows that you value the kingdom? Think about the merchant. He went and sold everything he had. Is he still a merchant? So maybe, <laughs> maybe his career change can uh, help us think through this. Think about how you handle grief. How do you handle adversity? And how do people see you handling those? Do you, do you show the hope that you have? Or do you give in to despair? How do you bring hope to those with addictions? Uh, there are programs that uh, focus on helping those with addictions, like Celebrate Recovery. Uh, our congregation has a Celebrate Recovery program uh, that has been very effective. But are all church members involved? Or do they say, well, those aren't our people? How do we spend our money? Do we drive a Maserati into the church parking lot? Well, that'd be fun. That would be fun. <laughs> uh, how are you spending your money and how does it show people what you value? How do you spend your time? What do you do with your time that shows people you value the kingdom? Now, there's a great story from Christians in past pandemics uh, about how Christians would bury the dead, whether they were in their family or not. And people came to know Christians by their great love for even people they weren't related to. Or think about the early church in Acts chapter 2. What were they known by? What did they do? Why did people want to join their group? Are we like that now? Or has church become more of a country club? That's a hard question. These two parables about the treasure and about the pearl Again, it's not about the treasure. It's not about the pearl. It's the process that the person went through to obtain that thing of value. And so these parables should make us very uncomfortable. Are you feeling uncomfortable right now? I'm feeling uncomfortable. These parables are designed to shake us into action. Point Snodgrass finishes it this way. He says, we have to demonstrate the presence of God's kingdom. Christians have so frequently failed to live their own gospel and have identified with certain cultural and political ideas that Jesus's message has been lost. The gospel we proclaim 
must deserve and explain the label treasure. And our lives must express the ultimate value found in Christ. People have got to see that we are different and that will want that will make them curious and want to learn more. What is this that you're part of? Why is it what makes it different? Why is it so valuable? And Craig Blomberg said that quite simply, true disciples are those who recognize that God's kingdom is so valuable that it's worth sacrificing whatever it takes to be its citizens. I want you to take some time this week, carve out some quiet time for yourself and think about what actions in your life show people the value of this kingdom. Why would they want to be a part of it? What about your life shows them your hope and what you value? Think about that this week and join me next week where we'll talk about another parable of Jesus and how his first century listeners would have understood it.